Sounds good to me. Cool. All right. My name's. Oh, there's a bunch of people now coming in. All right. Well, I'll just start. You guys can uh, listen along. So my name is Eric Escobar. I work for SecureWorks, um, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about replay tax with Software Defined Radio or SDR. Uh, okay, so what is a replay attack? It's exactly what it sounds like. An attacker captures a signal and they can play it back at a later point in time. Um, and you kind of wonder, like, how in this day and age can this be a thing? And it's because of, like, the Chinese crap that's out there. It's really, really easy to program this. And, uh, you know, they can make a quick buck off of it. And so that's a lot of the 433 megahertz stuff that's out there. Um, it's all replay attacks or it's all susceptible to it. So what is software defined radio? It's SDR. And this is a type of device where everything is done in software. You don't have to worry about an embedded device. You don't have to tune anything. Um, it's generally just out of the box, plug it in, plug and play and go. And it makes testing a lot easier. Um, and it makes learning and hacking way easier just because you have all these uh, extra frequencies at your disposal. So it's, it's pretty easy. Um, and the other thing that I really like about it, it's a really small form factor. So you don't have to have like a full ham closet, you know, just to power something. You usually do it straight off of your laptop and it's, it's pretty easy. Um, so some of the things that I want to talk about before we go into all of I mean, replay tax is uh, some of the verbiage you might need to know. First, duplexity. I don't know if that's a word, but I made it a word. Um, so basically, if you have half duplex, that means you can only transmit and receive on you know at, at a single time. So you can think of it like a walkie-talkie. On a walkie-talkie, you can only listen at a given point in time or talk at a given point in time. You can't do both. Um, that's full duplex. If you have something that's full duplex, you can transmit and receive at the same time. And so that's like a phone conversation. And that's probably what the the best example um, just to visualize it. Next is uh, samples. So a lot of times you'll see uh, software-defined radios measured in samples or MSPS, so that's million samples per second. Um, you know, it's a double-edged sword, so you can have way too many samples, and your processor is not going to be able to handle it. It's going to choke. You know, you're going to burn through all your battery. Um, you could have too few samples, and you're just not going to get a signal to come across just because you can't really see what's going on. Uh, so you kind of want to get in the Goldilocks zone. You want to get enough samples where your processor can handle it just fine, and you also want to have... Um, you basically just, you, you don't want to overclock your processor and you don't want to hurt it, uh, but you want to get enough to actually get a good signal to come across. Uh, next up is frequency ranges. A lot of people probably remember this from like high school physics, but a hertz is one cycle a second, so that's, you know, one, one uh, blip across the radar. Um, the higher frequency, the more cycles that you get per second. It's kind of elementary stuff, but there's a lot of people that they don't, they don't know the basics, and so when you start talking vernacular to them, they'll get kind of confused. So just as an FYI. This is, again, probably every high school science book. This is the, the spectrum that you're kind of dealing with. What I marked out in red here, um, that's generally like what you would see like a, a general SDR that you're going to buy on the market today. These are the ranges that it's going to kind of get. You can get anywhere from in the high kilohertz to the uh, you know mid mid gigahertz range, um, and you have all your ham frequencies. You have your GPS, Wi-Fi, all, all that good stuff is in there. Um, it's a, and it's all pretty accessible. So this is kind of just a quick overview, kind of kind of going over the different things that different. Um, software-defined radios have. So if you're just getting into it and you really just want to like, oh, I just want to mess around, I don't want to have a high cost, you can just get the $20. Uh, it's actually a TV tuner that you can buy off Amazon. Um, and I, I've, uh, so if you fi follow the wireless um, CTF for CypherCon, I posted all links to all of these so you don't have to go write them down or anything. You can just go pull them up from there and see what I'm talking about. But basically the first one, again, like I said, it's it's a TV tuner. So it's $20. You know, it can only receive, so you're not going to be able to transmit anything. But it has a really wide range and a pretty decent and sample rate. And so with this, you can see a lot of stuff. So you can see pretty much all the, the signals that we're going to talk about in the replay attacks that um, I'm going to show later on. You can receive all of those here. And so it's, it's a good real entry if you just want to mess around. Uh, it's cheap and easy to use. And there's a ton of tutorials on how to plug it in, drivers, all that stuff is really well supported. The next one on the list is the yardstick. The yardstick is, you know, for $115, it's, it's again another entry one. And this one will allow you to transmit. It doesn't have a, a super stellar um, frequency range, you know, 280 to 962 megahertz. Um, and it's only half duplex, so again, you can only listen or talk at a time. You can't, you know, you can't do both. 
Um, and then as you keep going down the list, the price keeps going up. And basically what you're getting with this is a wider sample set, more samples per second, um, you know, full duplex. Uh, and then if you look at something like the Blade RF, right now it's like 650, you get full duplex, you know, you have a, a huge range of things you can do and you can go crazy and then they have temperature stabilized ones. So what will happen is if you have like say a Blade RF and you're, um, you know, looking at something and if as it starts to heat up, your signals start to, to vary. And so they have temperature corrected ones. So pretty much the higher you go up on the scale, you get more features. Um, there's a lot more stuff that's not in here, but this is just a good general uh, view to look at of some of the features that they have um, and kind of how to compare them one to one. Because that's another hard thing that you get into with um, SDRs is you see one, oh, this is like two grand, this is three grand, you know, and they go up and up and up. And sometimes you don't even need those features. There's something really specialized that it's like, oh yeah, I don't need it shielded against, you know, X amount of radiation. I don't really care about that. I'm just, you know, trying to read my water meter in my backyard. Um, so yeah, just, it's kind of nice to know and kind of nice to have this. So, okay, you have a device that you want to capture a signal off of, you know, now what do you do? So the hard way you can do it is, you know, you can look at this waterfall chart uh, or waterfall graph and you can see signals as they come in. And this is typically the hard way of doing it. You know, you can look at the spectrum, you can try and, you know, make sense of what the bleeps and bloops look like. There's full websites dedicated to just like, oh, you know what, like, I don't know what the signal looks like and people will just sit there all day and ponder as to what they are. Um, but really, that that's a pretty difficult thing to do. And, and if you have to, you know, that's that's where you're going to do it. And you don't want to try and tease something, you know, tease some modulation out of this. It's it's going to be a pain. And there's a lot of troubleshooting that goes into it. So the easy way is you cheat. Um, and so if you have a device, if you own the device, you can look at the back of the device. And it'll have typically an FCC ID if it's something sold in the United States. Um, which is super nice because in order to get it registered with the FCC, you have to give out all the specs and all the modulation and pretty much everything that you could ever want as a hacker um, to use. So this, for example, is, is a motion detector. So you just look at the back of the, F of the, of the transmitter. You look at the FCC ID, write it down, and the FCC website is absolutely terrible. It, it's it's a horrible thing to try and go search for, look through all the menus. So some hero, I should have put his name on here because he definitely deserves credit, uh, he made FCC.io, and basically all it is is you go FCC.io slash whatever the FCC ID is, and it will forward you to the actual FCC page. So it saves you, you know, like 30 different steps in trying to figure out, like, how oh, where is this, what is this, you know, uh, who's the stakeholder in it, you don't have to worry about any of that, it'll just take you straight to the page, and it also makes it really easy if you're like in a forum discussion with somebody or you're posting something in Slack to just shoot them this link instead of trying to go dig up the FCC uh, link that would normally come up. And so with this, you can look at the test reports, you can see photos, you have the manuals, um, and really what you're looking here from this is the, uh, the frequency and the modulation. Um, so this, this is where it kind of gets into the, the more craftier part, the part that you kind of have to know a little bit more uh, your physics for. Um, so there's, you know, it, the people are probably most familiar with AM and FM uh, modulation or, you know, AM, FM frequencies, right? You have your, you have your radio and uh, this is what it means. You can see the little gif that's kind of spinning there. Um, amplitude modulation, the waves get bigger and smaller and frequency modulation, it kind of looks like a slinky. It'll get squished together and that's how data is encoded in there. Um, now the type of encoding uh, that that they're using here is a type of um, amplitude modulation called on-off keen. So basically all it is, is it's a, it's a digital way of transmitting data. And this is something that a lot of cheap electronics use. And uh, you can see that as it blips high, that's a one. If it blips low, that's a zero. And so you basically could just do binary over this. Um, and kind of just going into how all of these electronics work. Um, the reason that they do this is because you can have your radios, they can be really off. They, uh, you know, they don't have to be tuned super precise. Um, you're not really caring, you don't really care about interference because it's, it's one of these things where, uh, you know, you, you retransmit the signal probably every five or six times something gets triggered. Like, so for example, for a motion detector, you wave your hand in front of it and it will trigger six times instead of just one time. And that's basically to do with interference. It's a really cheap, easy, dumb way. It's kind of like a UDP way of, you know, dealing with something. You're not waiting for a transmission back. You're just sending it out into space and hoping that it goes through. And you send it a bunch of times just on the off chance that one of them gets through. Um, and then on the back end, the way that you deal with that is you just say, hey, if I receive a signal within X amount of milliseconds, just only choose one, ignore the rest. Um, and so that's, again, super easy way to, to code it, and so that's why they do it that way. Uh, so what's really awesome about this is that you can tune your software-defined radio um, and export the signal to a WAV file. 
This WAV file can be opened up, so I like to use Audacity. Uh, and if you tune it right, you can see the blips and bloops as they come across the screen, which is really cool because then you can, so the old school way of doing this is what you would normally have to do is uh, print this out with the time, you get some graph paper, and you would mark out where the ones are, where the zeros are, and then you could generate that signal. If you knew the timing of it, then you could replay it back uh, but that was the really hard way of doing it. And now there's a ton of tools out there that do it and, and they make it a lot nicer. And this, so this is actually a cleaned up wave file. Now, now that there's, um, you know, you make use of your processor. And basically what that does is it'll go and clean up the waveform for you to get these nice little blocks instead of you might see, um, you know, some jankiness, some waviness around it. And it'd be kind of hard to, to see your times from there. All right, so talking about some of the software that's out there. So um, so there's GQRX uh, and GNU Radio. Those are the two big um, you know, Unix platforms if you're using that. Uh, some of the other nice tools, if you're using Windows, are SDR Sharp. SDR Sharp has a couple of plugins, and this isn't on the slides, but I'm just going to mention it because it's super cool. I was just playing with it earlier. Is you can actually uh, snag beacons off of aircraft that are flying overhead. They're not encrypted, totally plain text, and they'll give you altitude. You know the call sign of the plane. They'll give you all that information of where it's going, and it's it's really crazy because you you know there are full-on programs built out for it that you can just have this running on your desktop, and you can see all the planes in your airspace where they're going, where they're headed. Um, you know, completely free, no internet required, and it's kind of terrifying that that information is just out there. Um, and so then, then the other part of it too is, uh, if you have a HackRF, um, Michael Osman has awesome, awesome software. And he has an awesome tutorial that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, that basically is a two day class condensed, you know, to a bunch of YouTube videos they can download for free. I think it's like a couple thousand dollar class, but, um, we'll talk more about that. Then one of the other things that I just got into recently is, uh, RFCAT. It's like Netcat, but for RF stuff, it's super easy to use, super simple. Everything's a Python object. So if you're writing, you know, some, uh, you know, software defined radio program and, you know, Python, super killer, super easy to use. You can receive, transmit, encode stuff, uh, however you want to do it. And then one of the other even cheater tools that I use is this, uh, on off keen tools. So, oh, okay, tools. Um, and basically what this does is this will clean up your WAV files. It'll process your WAV files so you don't have to worry about any of it. Uh, you know, it'll search for frequencies. It'll look for on-off keying. So if you don't know maybe exactly what the frequency is of, you know, some device that you're using, if you're trying to black box it and you don't have an FCC ID to go off of, you can use this oh, OK tools. It'll scan the spectrum, look for on-off keying. It'll find the baud rate for you. All these things that you would normally have to, you know, get some graph paper out for, you know, open up MS Paint and, you know, try and drag some lines on. You don't have to do that anymore. This tool takes care of a lot of it. The only downside is that, as far as I know, again, I've only played with it a little bit, um, that it only works for the yardstick one. But it, it's pretty killer. And if you're, uh, you know, just just trying to inspect some stuff, it, it's a super nice way to go. So this is a really simplistic way. Um, if you just want to get up off the ground uh, doing a replay signal, if you have a hack RF, you can just type this line in there. Um, and uh, there should be an underscore in the HackRF transfer. Um, but basically, you use the HackRF transfer, and you can receive, dump it out to a WAV file, which is your .raw, and then the dash F, that's, a, uh, that's the frequency that you're on. And so it's, it's in um, uh, hertz, and so that number should be 434 megahertz, but it's 433 you know, million hertz. So that's just without, without any of the scientific notation to kind of reduce the variable down. Um, but so this is all you have to do. It's literally you write it out to one file and then you replay that file at that frequency. And what's nice is that they give you the frequency as an option there that you can pass in. So if you can record it in um, at a lower frequency and replay it out on a higher one, that that's, you know, it'll definitely work. And the reason why you would want to do that is so say you want to receive on a very narrow frequency, you can receive on a very narrow one and transmit on a wideband one. And the reason why you might want to do that is if somebody has some protection in place, like for like, say they have a rolling code, what you can use that for is you can receive on the very narrow band, but pretty much DOS the rest of it. Um, and so what that'll let you do is accept a rolling code, transmit and DOS at the same time. So just, I mean, that, that's above what we're going to go over today, but that's a reason why you would want it. And it's a really cool feature that you have. Um, people like Sammy Camcar have used that to do their roll jam attack and break into pretty much any car that's on the market today. Um, okay, so what's vulnerable? It's shocking, actually, the, the amount of cheap, you know, 434 megahertz stuff that you can get out there on the internet. Uh, so let's see if the demo gods are with me. This should play. Um, so, uh, if I, so, 
basically this is a motion detector and you can see that I've taken the battery out of it um, but you can still get it to play it in a replay tag. So I turned off the volume because it's a really annoying sound but you can see that it, that the deal lit up. It plays um, without that. And you can do the same thing with a doorbell which is incredibly fun. I've never really grown up. So I go over to my in-laws house and I doorbell ditch them from like half a house away and they have no idea what's happening. I feel kind of bad and I really hope they never watch this talk because we've done it mercilessly. Um, so some other things that you can do, this is also a really fun one. So they have these, uh, they're E-Tech City uh, wireless outlets. These things are great just to have, you know, if you have something you just want to like, maybe some backyard lights you want to turn on and off. Well, one of the things that I started playing with was like, well, I'd like to turn them off from like my Raspberry Pi or my Arduino. Like, how am I going to do that? Well, if you have something that's like some cheap 434 megahertz module, you can just do a replay attack um, and turn them on and off however you want. So this is going to be one of the challenges tomorrow. So if you guys are doing the uh, wireless capture the flag, um, the goal is going to be to not to turn on the last one. And so since they're all in a series, you have to turn them on in sequential order. And if you turn one off, um, it'll mess you up. So this is what it should look like. So you see how they all click on sequentially. That's the end goal of it. So if you're doing the wireless capture the flags tomorrow, that's that's one you may want to pay attention to. Uh, so this is my uncle's super swanky neighborhood that he lives in, and you'd think that like uh, this gated subdivision where each house is like you know three million dollars minimum that they would have a better gate than this. But I can just basically sit here, wait for somebody to go by, catch the signal, and replay the signal, and the gate just opens, no problem at all. Um, this one was really fun too because you could just hold the gate open and so you get somebody come out there and say like what like what's going on why you know why won't this gate close um, and yeah you can just you can really mess with people with this stuff uh, so this is the really fun one this will also be in the wireless capture the flags tomorrow if anybody's brave enough to attempt this this is a dog shock collar that doesn't have any rolling code or any anything to to make it not to do this so I'll kind of run it through its paces here I don't know what this one does so it lights it up, and I think it vibrates. There's no volume there. You can see it move across the screen. So one of the really scary things about this one, and I haven't tried it out yet, is that the way that this is encoded is, uh, so there's 255 value that you could put. So the shock color, you can have a range of 1 to 100 to shock someone with, or your, to shock your dog with, right? But there's a possible value of 255 in there. So I don't know if it just omits it after 100 or what's going to happen, but there's only one way to test it. And I'm, not, I'm definitely not brave enough if this thing can put, you know, a 100-pound German Shepherd on its butt. It, it would just cook me. Um, uh, so, okay, so if you want to learn some more about, you know, software-defined radio, if you kind of want to get started with it, um, or even if you know a little bit about it, you have your software-defined radio, I'd really suggest going over to greatscottgadgets.com slash SDR. So Michael Osmond teaches a two-day two class that's, like, taught at, like, Black Hat. It's taught at, um, I think, DEF CON. But basically this class is he takes you soup to nuts of, like, hey, you don't know anything about radio? We're going to teach you all about it, how to, you know, how to write decimal or decibel notation. Um, we're going to show you how to use the HackRF, you know, soup to nuts, how to perform the replay attacks. Um, it's a really, really great class. It's, I mean, it's very, very dense, um, but it's completely free online on the Internet. And this is, again, it's a really expensive class you have to go to. And I kind of was just Googling around and I happened to find it. Um, and it's it's a really, really top-notch class. Uh, the other website that I really like is RTL SDR. Um, this website you can go to, people in the forums are really responsive. So if you do have that hard use case scenario of like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know what this frequency is, um, you know, maybe you've never seen like, like some, something new, like a LoRa frequency out there, and you're like, I don't know what this like, you know, slanting pattern is across my waterfall display. These guys are all super sharp, and they'll be able to answer pretty much all of your questions. Um, there's definitely been a lot of times where I'm like, I have no idea what the signal is, and they're like, oh, you're really dumb because it's, you know, the wrong coding scheme or you don't have enough samples or you're not collecting enough samples in order to, you know, demodulate it and see what's actually out there. Um, so before I go into any questions, uh, I just want to talk a bit about the wireless CTF tomorrow. So there is a uh, Twitter handle that, you know, I created. It's the CypherCon WCTF. It's followed by the main CypherCon um uh, Twitter account. And so if you guys are interested in taking part in it, pretty much all the clues, all the hints, all the challenges will all be tweeted throughout there. Um, and so if you, like, say you find a flag, you have a question, anything at all, you can DM the account. We have multiple people looking at it, uh, and so you can kind of go from there. 
uh, with all your questions. And again, a lot of the things that I've talked about in terms of like the training, uh, the hardware and all that stuff, that's all on that Twitter account too that you can just go check out um, whenever you want. So does anybody have any questions? Is everybody really tired? Uh, I should know. It's cyphercon underscore WCTF. And it's, if, if I said that wrong, it's on the main, uh, cyphercon, uh, Twitter account. You can just look at it. It's something that they follow. Uh, if you don't have a hack RF, I have one that you can use. Um, I have a hack RF. I have a yardstick and I'm definitely willing to show people how to use it and all that stuff if you don't know how. Or if you're just like, oh, I need a loaner to do the challenge just because I didn't bring mine, I have one that you can use. And I, I have a couple other SDRs too. Um, if you want to mess with some of the bigger ones, I can tell there's any. Yeah, so that's that's going to be like the main base of operations. So I'll be up there tomorrow morning when it opens up. I think it opens up at 9. I'm not too sure. I'll have to go look at the schedule. Um, but basically, I'll be up there, and we're going to have stuff kind of spread out depending on how the weather is tomorrow. It'll be spread out out and around Milwaukee. There's you know some bounds. It's not something crazy. Um, a couple of the challenges, there's going to be war driving. So basically, what we've done is we've pre-war driven a bunch of Milwaukee. Uh, we have 7,500 points and uh, so that nobody can really brute force it. The, basically, like, say it's out of 100 points. I'm not sure what the point value is of it yet. Um, but say you get, you know, 3,500 points, then you're only going to get around half of the points uh, that are totally possible. So you're not just going to like, oh, I'm just going to go generate a gajillion BSS IDs um, and use that as something like that. That'll prevent that. Uh, but basically, I'll be up there the entire day. You can tweet if you have questions. Um, there'll be wireless foxes running around. There's going to be number stations on ham radio frequencies. Um, and again, all the hints will kind of come out. I'll probably, I'm not going to probably dump everything all at once. I'll kind of see how things go, but pretty much all the SDR challenges will be up in that building or it will be up in that, in that room. Um, and I think there's room for like 15, 20 people, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, we'll go with that. And if you, again, if you guys have questions, you can even tweet at me tonight and I'll, I'll reply to a lot of them. Um, but that's, that's how all the logistics are going to be thrown out there. Anybody else? Any questions? We good? All right. Well, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks to everybody actually showing up at like midnight right now. It's past my bedtime.